I love this quote from Jonathan Swift. He says, he was a bold man what first eat an oyster. Mm. Whoever did actually opened the world up for us because now we can have them too. Uh, look at that one. Everything about it is delicious in its own way. Even the seawater that's just nestled in the shell. <laughs> Those are a very different texture. I mm -hmm. think the taste of an oyster is so complex. I mean, I'm stumbling over ways of describing it. Like a tender cooked vegetable. It kind of tastes like cucumbers. I get the impression of deep water. Soft fruity or a melon ball. Sea spray kind of smell. They have a crisp, almost crunchy texture to them. And then has this wonderful lingering umame savoriness that kind of stays on the palate after you eat it. Yeah, I can definitely taste yeah. the sweet. Metallic, intensely briny, just kind of wash all over your tongue. This talk may seem, well, esoteric, but it's all part of the language of oysters. It's kind of part of the life in the Northwest. Because an oyster has such a rich sense of place, literally what you're eating is that place. I know that sounds poetic, but it is in fact true. I just love oysters. David George Gordon is one of these sharp-shelled invertebrates biggest fans. It's saltier and it has a little more an earthier flavor, I think. Yeah. Oysters are intimately associated with their surroundings. It, it is a, a, the very end of a long, deep estuary, so it makes sense that it's going to have a lot of earthiness. Yeah, right. They're and, filtering uh, all this water. 50 or 60 gallons of water per day goes through them. Whatever is in that water is passing through that oyster. I can't think of any other animal that has that intimate relationship with its environment. There's even a word to describe this phenomenon. Miroir is a word, sort of a play on words from the French word terroir, which refers to how wine grown in certain soil in certain regions takes on the flavor of that place. So the basic concept is the flavor of place. Travis Oya and Rita Welch are oyster farmers on Neetarts Bay. It is an animal, but it is a lot like a produce crop. We plant our seeds and then we don't have to water our plants or feed our plants nutrients because the ocean does all of that for us. We treat them like they're our little pets or our little babies. That's me hugging the oysters. Before they get that tender loving care though, Travis and Rita's babies do take a few hard knocks. That's just a cluster of oysters. There's probably like 25 oysters there. This is what we'll break in and hammer them up into individuals and bring them back out sprinkle them on the ground and let them grow a little bit more. These are oysters that we broke off clusters probably two months ago and dumped them back on the bottom here to give them a chance to heal up. So now we're sorting through and anything that's still alive and has a nice enough shape to go to market, we're basketing these up and these will go to town. Tightly sealed inside each one comes the flavor of its home bay. In Neatharts Bay, there's very little freshwater influence. Whiskey Creek is the only freshwater influence. It's a small bay and it's quite shallow as well. The bay almost completely drains and refills with every tide. So it creates a very fluctuating system, whereas other bays like Tillamook, for instance, has a large freshwater influence because of all of the rivers that feed into it. That's what gives them those unique flavors. Rita can taste a difference even within Neetarts Bay. Oysters from the west side, where there's more saltwater influence, taste saltier and have a more complex flavor. 
while the East Siders have a more earthy or oystery flavor. To be clear, we're not talking about different kinds of oysters. Here's some background. The Northwest's native oyster is a relatively small guy known as the Olympia. Olympias flourished in bays all along the West Coast and were a staple food for native peoples. Early European settlers feasted on the tasty mollusks, almost to the point of extinction. It took an Asian transplant to save the industry from collapse. Pacific oysters were actually brought to North America in the 1920s from Japan, and they became sort of the oyster of choice for farming because they grow a lot faster than our native species here. Pacific oysters have become the most intensely cultivated oysters in the world. But grow this single species in a particular environment and its flavor becomes unique. Here's a few examples, starting with the South Puget Sound area. Case Inlet is at the end of a long estuary, producing earthy, even mushroom-like flavors. Totten Inlet's algae-rich water makes for some of the strongest flavored oysters. Nearby, Eld Inlet's lower salinity gives the oysters a milder flavor. But Coastal Neetarts Bay produces Pacifics with a distinctive briny taste. And to make things more interesting, it's not just where an oyster grows that matters. It's also how it's grown. Some grow in bags that hang suspended in the water. The ones that are in the floating bags, they have a different taste to them, and it's because there's different algae species in the water column, along with different levels of salinity. So what the ones on the ground are getting is different than the ones in the bag. These lines of floating bags not only keep the oysters suspended in the water column 24-7, they also shape their shells. The tide's doing the work for us, so the bag will flip one way, and then when the tide goes out, it'll drop. And that tumbling action breaks off the new growth around the edges. Breaking off that growth stimulates the oyster to grow deep, so it develops this nice deep cup and has a good meat content. So these pretty shells are appreciated by the person eating them, but more so the chef. Is a gorgeous oyster. They are also alive. They are living creatures. Oftentimes you can see a heartbeat. Did you see that? There's a heart right there. We'll take his word for it. Probably most people don't want to discuss that either. Ooh, it moved. <laughs> All kidding aside, oysters are animals. And typically, they're raised in a hatchery like this one at Whiskey Creek, also on Neetarts Bay. This is our algae room. About 60% of the work we do is just growing food for the oyster. And it's just like growing plants in your garden. We add nutrients, light, all the things that plants need. These were started today, so they're very light in color. And then if we're doing our job right, three or four days later, they're nice and dark. The maturing algae are then transferred to larger tanks bathed in light and pumped up on a nutrient-rich diet. So this is the last step in the process. Uh, this tank's a couple of days old. It was inoculated with maybe four or five of those dark bottles. And now we have, you know, on the order of trillions of algae cells in this tank that we can pump out to our larvae. That would be oyster larvae, who are also carefully nurtured, starting with their parents. We've babied these guys and fed them a lot of food and warmed up the water for them and played some soft music uh, to get them ready to spawn. Right when they're ready, I stick a knife in them and shuck them. This one's probably only got 30 to 40 million eggs inside of it. Really over half of the mass of this animal is eggs. We take eggs and sperm from mature, ready to reproduce animals, fertilize them, and then add them to our hatchery tanks. For the next few weeks, the larval oysters will feast on all that carefully cultivated algae. And in this process, it's the survival of the fattest. These guys are about eight days old, and so if they don't catch on this 85 micron screen, they go in the garbage. It's just part of the process, it's sad, we cry a little bit, but a lot of our job is throwing larvae away as well. Once strained, the spat, as these juvenile oysters are called, gets one final examination. These guys are looking pretty good, pretty active, and I'm able to measure them here on the microscope to get an idea of how big they are, if they would hold still. 
For now, these larvae are free-floating wigglers, but all that mobility is about to come to an end. As they reach the end of their larval period, there's a couple of cues that we use um, to know these larvae are ready to set. For one, they grow a foot, a lot like a snail's foot, and they also grow an eye spot that allows them to sense dark and light, and that's another signal that they're almost ready. This finished bundle contains millions of mature larvae that will only be mobile for a few days. So getting it to growers fast is crucial. We do a lot of FedEx shipping here and it goes out overnight to grower, dumps them in the tank uh, full of oyster shell. And uh, we did our job right, you know, the next day they'll all be attached, so. Spat that's not shipped out is fostered here at the hatchery. They're only about uh, three or four days old, but these tiny specks on the shell, each one of those specks is an individual oyster. Whiskey Creek grows baby oysters for dozens of independent operators, including Travis and Rita. But not all will stay in Oregon. Our state's relatively straight coastline makes for just a few oyster-friendly bays. While Washington's rugged shore, along with Puget Sound's numerous fingered inlets, make it possible for large operations to dominate the industry. So Taylor Shellfish Farms is a fifth generation family owned company. We've grown now to be the largest producer of farm shellfish in North America with over 500 employees. We have about 20 different farm sites. But even on this massive scale, the finer points of Meroir still apply. Meroir is the basis for how oysters are marketed. And so when you go into an oyster bar and has 10 different Pacific oysters on the menu, each one will have a name that's associated to generally where they come from. This is Totten Inlet Oyster Farm. On this farm, we grow single oysters on bottom. On this beach dough, we typically grow Pacifics, Olympias, and Virginicas. This one's perfect for harvest size, so I can shuck it open for you. And so I'll just um, enjoy this one right now. Mm. 30 years ago, 80% of the oysters that Taylor produced were shucked for meats, and about 20% were sold live in the shell. That's completely flip-flopped in the last 30 years, where now we're selling over 80% of our oysters live in the shell. And that really, I think, is indicative of sort of a trend in the marketplace, that you see oyster bars popping up everywhere. A lot of really fine restaurants are putting raw oysters on their menu. It's a trend that we expect to see continue. A 2012 U.S. Department of Commerce report called aquaculture the fastest growing form of food production in the world. And with oysters already accounting for $136 million worth of that yearly production, you can expect words like meroir to become more common. Rita and Travis are happy with their small slice of that growth. And it's a lot of work, lots of steps from seed to table, but at the end of the day, it's worth it. When people stop in and are like, I love your oysters, they're the best oysters I've ever had in Tarts Bay, it's so nice and clean, it really does. It makes you feel good to know that you're doing something local and sustainable. And if you have that niche market of having such a clean, fresh oyster, and people love that. Yummy. It's really a good feeling. I feel accomplished. Delivering the oysters to the chefs on Friday, they really appreciate the fact that I'm not sending somebody else. I'm actually handing them their bag of oysters every week. So there's a connection. What's up, buddy? Good morning. <laughs> I've put a lot of work in. Now it's time to reap the rewards. Reward. <laughs>